console wars and being a producer at Sega of America. There was huge money now in the video game industry. Video games had arrived. Coin-op arcade games had paved the way, making electronic gaming not only acceptable, but outright cool and fun. It was cool and hip to play video games. It is ironic, when I was playing games as a kid, they and I were uncool because of my playing games. And when I first created games, I was a geek or nerd. It was not positive or flattering. But now, the very same thing is cool and hip. Oh well, I made the industry become cool and hip. I forged the video game industry into what it has become. I was a founder. <laughs> and I now am working in one of the coolest industries on the planet, regardless of my being uncool then. As the industry grew, newspapers and magazines referred to the video game industry as a mini Hollywood or the new Hollywood because of its increasing visibility and actor and movie tie-ins. Not to mention that video games were grossing as much money as all movies across the world combined. Games were a big business and the industry was only in its infancy. And of course, we all know how much bigger the computer and video game industry has become since those early times. Let's get back to the early years of home video consoles, a time when there were many consoles vying to rule them all. In the end, there could only be one console, or so the console titans of Nintendo and Sega and later Sony would argue and fight. And fight they did in the console wars. Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES, revolutionized the home video game market with its low cost, home video game console that delivered a good experience. The NES was so popular, it was sold in supermarkets, in clothing stores, liquor shops, toy stores, and computer and electronic shops. In other words, there was nowhere you could go without seeing a NES for sale. It was everywhere. But then, Sega jumped into the video game console fray with its Sega Master System. Although there were competitors to the two console manufacturers, Nintendo and Sega became the world leaders and the gorillas against all other aspirants that would hope to compete against them. And Nintendo and Sega would fight themselves for the crown for decades. Nintendo branched into and pioneered handheld gaming with the Game Boy, which was effectively the Nintendo Entertainment System miniaturized into a black and white handheld device. Sega countered it with their own Sega Game Gear handheld device. Atari Corp joined in with an Atari Lynx handheld device. But Nintendo once again rose to the top and crushed the handheld market competitors and became the sole big on-the-go gaming platform. The evolution of gaming consoles and handhelds took off right as the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo grew to dominance. Much later in the console wars, Sony would introduce the Sony PlayStation Portable or PSP, which would further raise the portable experience expectations substantially. So let's get back to Sega. Sega of Japan had developed a new video game console called the Mega Drive. They wanted to sell the console internationally and felt their console was so revolutionary that it was the true genesis of the next generation gaming for homes. And so they dubbed their new console in the United States the Sega Genesis. The Sega Genesis was a huge advancement in the video game console capabilities and developer-friendly main microprocessors like the Motorola 68000. It also had a parallel Z80 microprocessor 
which was typically used for audio playback. It had a coprocessor to accelerate transforms, matrix operations, and non-integer math. And of course, it had a dedicated graphics processing unit, GPU, that supported numerous graphic modes and character tile plus motion object sprite art formats. The Sega Genesis was to bring the full coin-op arcade game experience home into the living room. Well, it did not quite deliver the coin-op experience, but it did deliver a significant improvement over the current generation of gaming consoles, like the Sega Master System and the Nintendo Entertainment System NES. However, Nintendo quickly reacted and introduced the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or the SNES, the SNES, right as Sega introduced its Sega Genesis. Comparing apples to apples, the Super Nintendo was pretty comparable to the Sega Genesis in its raw horsepower. The key differences, to me, were that the Nintendo had gimmicky graphic tricks. The Genesis was much easier to program and both could deliver great gaming experiences. The bottom line, the Sega Genesis was on par with the Super Nintendo, with both having unique strengths, and both delivered great gaming experiences. Sega of Japan, or SOJ, decided to form a USA division called Sega of America, SOA, to operate within the United States trade laws as an unrestricted manufacturer first-party publisher and third-party licensor to develop games for its new video game console, the Sega Genesis, aka the Sega Mega Drive from Japan. They similarly formed Sega of Europe, SOE, to do the same, to manufacture and publish in Western Europe. Each Sega division operated under the guidance of Sega of Japan. Nintendo and Sony use the exact same model to manage their global operations and businesses. As happened so often, I was between contracts again, and so I needed work. I was unsure where my next contract was going to come from, and I was told of an opportunity at that newly formed Sega of America. I learned that Sega was hiring. They had a producer position open. Well, it turned out Following the Sega Master System, the Genesis's predecessor, Sega of America was formed to launch and make games for the next generation Sega console, not just represent the hardware. They were to make Genesis software games. The idea of being a producer piqued my interest, and so I interviewed for the position. They offered me the job the very next day expressing their main reservation was that I was extremely overqualified as a developer, but they agreed those skills would help me manage external developers as a producer. The head of Sega's division in America was named Ken Balthazer, Sr., as apparently his son was somewhere in the video game industry as well, Ken Balthazer, Jr. He was a large, thick-headed, loud buffoon of a man, Ken Balthazer was a fool. His ignorance and zero self-awareness emboldened him to strut about as if he was genuinely smart and capable. Again, he was an idiot. Ken hired legions of low-integrity con artist developers within a week of my starting. I told him they were weak, incapable developers, and I gave him specific reasons with evidence supporting my position. But Ken was focused on signing developers instead of signing good developers. He was about numbers and quantity, not about quality. I learned from another executive that they were bonused according to hitting key performance indicators, KPIs, which included starting a specified number of game contracts within the initial console launch window. It made sense, sadly, the leadership wanted their personal bonuses even if it hurt Sega's chances of making good gains and succeeding, and so they signed developers regardless of their ability to succeed. 
Once more, I saw that self-serving evil pervaded everywhere. I recall one time a developer visited us at Sega. Two men visited us at Sega of America to pitch being developers for the Genesis Dick Tracy or any game we would possibly want. They were desperate for work, but they pitched Dick Tracy. One of the men had a very thick accent, but he spoke English well enough for me to understand him. He brought me aside and let me know that he was one of a dozen engineers and artists from Lithuania that were promised freedom and employment, but instead they became indentured servants working long hours with virtually no pay and only taken out once a week for social events like a movie. I could not believe my ears. This guy was telling me the company there pitching was actually an illegal sweatshop for video game developers. I had never imagined such a thing. Despite calling out the situation to the head of development, Ken Balthaser, he signed that developer and his sweatshop to do illegal alien engineering and artwork for games. There was no way to describe my offense to the evil of enslaving people to make games. In hindsight, Maybe I should have even called immigration and sought to have them shut down. Maybe I did the right thing by letting them remain in the U.S. and maybe find their ultimate way to legal residence or citizenship. Oh, choices. We cannot ever know what might have been. We only know what has been and imagine what might be.